Okay, good morning, everybody. I can see that people are starting to come into the webinar. Fantastic. We're getting quite a few people coming in, which is great. Very good to see. Right, the numbers are ticking up, which is fantastic. And I'll just give it a minute or two so everyone can figure out the technology uh, before we get started this morning. Okay, very good. So good morning, everybody. We're just waiting for everyone to join us today. We're still getting a lot of people joining the webinar this morning. And we're just giving it a bit of time for everyone to sort out the technical details and, and come online. Uh, looks like we've got quite a few participants joining us today, which is fantastic uh, in our first webinar. Okay. Right, the numbers have stopped trickling in. Oh, and as I say that, of course, another five or so people jump on. <laughs> So I think everyone seems to have worked out the technology now and we are a couple of minutes past time. So we are going to get started. So good morning, everybody, and good afternoon and good evening as well as we welcome people from across Australia and the globe to our first webinar for the GIN ANZ group. Uh, my name is Zach Munn and I'll be the host for today's webinar uh, and I'm the current chair of the GIN uh, ANZ um, uh, regional group as well. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar today. We have some fantas fantastic speakers lined up uh, this morning uh, and we're really excited to, to get into the presentations and hear from, from these experts um, on these topics and then have some discussions with you as well. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing First Nations led guideline development and supporting prevention and management of COVID-19 in primary health care. And, and it's my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Catherine Chamberlain and Dr. Jason Agostino to uh, present for us today. So let's go through some of the technical details. So thank you once again for joining us on our first ANZ GIN webinar. Now you'll, you will have noticed that you've all joined in what's called listen only mode. We're using Zoom webinar today, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't interact with us. So you should all be able to type and interact in the chat. Uh, so hopefully you can all see that function. And it would be great if you could enter into the chat just who you are and where you're from and, and if uh, anything else that you find interesting throughout this webinar, it'd be great to see um, who's joining us from from across, across Australia and the globe. So please do um, say hello in the chat and, and, and tell us where you're from as well. Now, if you want to ask a formal question, we will be monitoring the chat, but it's a little bit easier for us if you use the Q&A functionality in Zoom. Uh, so you should be able to see that on your, on your Zoom bar as well. Um, so if you have any formal questions for us today, please do use that Q&A functionality. Um, if you can't figure it out, because um, sometimes the technology is difficult, uh, please feel free to use the chat as well. I should let you all know that we are recording this webinar today and we will be putting it up online uh, after, after today. I'm not sure how long it will take us, hopefully not too long. Uh, it will be going up on the uh, Guidelines International Network website and also on anzguidelinenetwork.com. And if you have any feedback for us today, this is our first webinar, as I mentioned. So if you do have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and please send this to a, a um, nz at gin.net. Okay, uh, so firstly, we'll start with the acknowledgement of country and, and I'd like to acknowledge that um, uh, I'm based in Adelaide at, at JBI and that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And we also acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from across Australia and recognise that this country always was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Uh, we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today and welcome to you all. 
So just quickly, uh, you may have heard, hopefully you've heard about uh, GIN ANZ, uh, but we are a new revitalised uh, guideline uh, network uh, uh, available to people who are interested in evidence-based guidance across, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we've just started up uh, really uh, again this year. And we are an inclusive and collaborative network uh, with a common interest in improving the health of Australians and New Zealand, New Zealanders through evidence-based guidance. And we would welcome you all to join, join us uh, and become involved. Uh, and you can learn a little bit more about us at, um, uh, at our website uh, as well. So uh, if you are interested in guidelines, if you're interested in evidence-based healthcare, if you're interested in, if you're a developer or a, or a user or an implementer, please do um, um, please do feel free to join us um, and keep up to date with everything we are doing. Okay, and if you want to tweet about this webinar as well, um, you can use the hashtag uh, ANZGINWebinar, uh, and you can also tweet to us at our handle, our social media account on Twitter, which is GIN uh, underscore ANZ. Okay, all right. Well, that's enough from me. Uh, I'm sure you've all been waiting to hear from our excellent presenters today. So what's what what's going to happen today is um, we have two fantastic presenters who will both be speaking for about 20 minutes each. Uh, and then we're going to have a bit of a, a Q&A session where we'll get your questions from the chat and from the Q&A uh, and have a bit of a, a roundtable discussion as well. But it's my real pleasure today to welcome our presenters, uh, Dr. Catherine Chamberlain and Dr. Jason Agostino. So Kath is an Associate Professor and NHMRC Career Development Fellow at La Trobe University. And she is a descendant of a Trowalwe people in Tasmania and has been a public health researcher for almost two decades with a focus on health equity in the perinatal period. She is a Cochrane Review author and a member of an NHMRC synthesizing translation of research evidence or the Guidelines for Guidelines group. Uh, during COVID-19, she has been working as an epidemiologist at the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services and keeping very busy, I'm sure, and part of a NACHO, RACGP, ANU and the Witcher team developing rapid guidelines for Abig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And Jason is a GP and an epidemiologist with a commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. He is a medical advisor at the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, uh, NACHO, and does clinical work at Gurani Yilmaka, an Aboriginal community controlled service in Yarraba. And he is also a lecturer at the ANU College of Health and Medicine and focuses on implementation research in cardiovascular disease prevention. Uh, through COVID-19 pandemic, uh, through the pandemic, he has been a member of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 advisory group, uh, the guidelines leadership group of the National COVID-19 Evidence Task Force. And it's fantastic to see a few people uh, online today who have, who have come from the task force as well. Uh, and has also been a part of a team developing rapid guidelines for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to Kath, who is going to start off the presentation today. So, Kath, I will hand over to you and stop sharing my screen. And just, to, just, just you're on mute there, Kath. Oh, we we sorry, Kath. We st we still we still can't hear you. Sorry, we, it looks like you're still on mute. How's that? Can you hear That's me now? Perfect. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just try and get back to presenter screen. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, Zach, for the um, warm introduction and also for the acknowledgement. And for those of you who maybe joining us from outside Australia, this acknowledgement to country is a custom that we've had in Australia for many, many thousands of years. It's a bit like another custom, I guess, that many of you will be familiar with when you go to someone's house, we knock on the door and somebody, we wait for someone to welcome us in. And, um, you know, we, you know, we've been doing this too and working, we have over, we've had over 350 distinct Aboriginal nations within this country land that's now called Australia. And we've been able to you know, coexist in relative harmony for, for many, many thousands of years with these kind of really important cultural customs that show um, respect for each other. So I just really want to thank you for that. And um, as Zach said, I'm going to, we're going to have two sessions today. I'll be talking first to you about their guidelines for guidelines and engaging Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. 
in God, development of guidelines and then hand over to Jason, who's going to be talking more about um, some, some really great examples of this that Zach outlined. I think we were going to do a little poll now. Is that right, Zach? Yes, I think so. But uh, Kath, we can't see your slides at the moment. So would you uh, be happy to share your screen? Oh, no. Gosh, sorry, I'll, really technical. I'll, I'll launch a first poll. So uh, to get everyone engaged today, um, we'll be doing a couple of polls. So hopefully you've now seen a little pop-up uh, box on your screen. And uh, we're asking a couple of questions here. Are you of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander origin? And have you been involved in developing guidelines for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Okay, and we're getting those responses in uh, now. Fantastic, thanks everyone. Uh, and then I'll share these um, responses in a second. And Kath, we can see your slides now. Fantastic, oh, great. thank you. Thank you. Okay, about 80% of people have voted. That looks good. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Hopefully everyone's finding the pop-up box there. Okay, I'll finish that off and I'll share these results. So Kath, can you see these results? Yes, great, thank you. So we've got um, three people who are Aboriginal joining us today, welcome, and 36 non-Aboriginal people, thank you. And quite a lot of people that have been involved in nearly half of you have been 38% involved in developing guidelines with Aboriginal people before. So thank you all for joining us today. I'll go on to the next, next slide. There we go. So um, the NHMSC guidelines for guidelines, it's one of the most popular, NH, I think it's the most downloaded National Health and Medical Research Council document. It's a how-to guide for how to develop um, guidelines that meet the standards for NHMRC and it's relevant for clinical practice, environmental and public health guidelines that are being developed overseas and in Australia. And they've just been revamped and we've all been um, led very ably through this process by the incredible NHMRC team, including Stephanie Goodrick who's with us today and Gerard. So um, thank you for guiding us through that. And Zachary, as you mentioned. And I'm going to be talking to you today about one of the modules within that, which is engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in guideline development. So you are the Guideline International Network and you're all the experts in knowing how important it is to engage people who are being impacted by guideline in the development of those guidelines. You know, it's one of the most critical elements of ensuring that guidelines are high quality, relevant and acceptable, and they're more likely to be effective. So engagement, it's been around for a while. It's described as a relationship that's built on trust and integrity. And it's more than just a tokenistic informational consultation. It involves giving people a degree of power. And this is Cheryl Lanstein's ladder of participation that's been around as long as I have. It's a long time, since 1969. And the richness and depth here is very important because we all know it takes years to develop trust and it can just be destroyed very quickly. This is, you know, engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australian guidelines is desperately needed. And I'm not going to dwell on these statistics today, but it's well recognised that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people suffer the worst health outcomes in Australia. And that is due to a long history of violence since the first Europeans arrived, many of whom were traumatised um, coming off prison after years of living on prison hulks in England and um, their jailers and the likes. And since then, we've suffered a huge amount of violence, socioeconomic deprivation, ongoing discrimination and racism. And this has really had a serious impact on our health. And a major problem of this has been with trying to rectify this situation has been having a, a lack of self-determination involvement of Aboriginal people in developing effective, acceptable programs to address these issues. And this is reported in numerous government and other reports. So we really do need good quality guidelines that are acceptable and relevant. And this points to the critical importance of engaging Aboriginal people in the development of all guidelines. So, but it hasn't been easy for Aboriginal people to be involved in this process because of the history and the trust and the research trusting in researchers, government and guideline developers to date. 
And, you know, to understand why, it's really important to understand the historical context with regard to Aboriginal people and research or science more generally. And I know as guideline development experts in this area, you are all really conscious of the importance of um, context in applying research evidence into practice. That's what you do. So firstly, architectural, uh, sorry, archaeological evidence demonstrates that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been living in this land called Australia now for at least 65,000 years. And during this time, communities have developed sophisticated knowledge systems for managing the environment and understanding, interpreting and communicating information. And these sophisticated knowledge systems have underpinned a thriving culture. And it's worth noting that at the time of colonisation, there's really clear evidence that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and children were far healthier and happier than the Europeans that arrived here at the time and that were living in Europe at the time. But since colonisation, there's been successive destruction of these ancient knowledge systems. They've been disregarded and in many cases destroyed. And this has all been aided by government authorities and our university institutions. Um, you know, Aboriginal people were forbidden to practice language and culture until fairly re recently. Um, you know, in my lifetime, and there's often been this re really disturbing history, historical reports with people being of you know, severe punishments like removal of people's children for practicing language and culture. And this kind of threat has a real chill effect on the whole community. So there is an assumption of inferior inferiority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges, despite so much evidence to the contrary. For instance, in my field of public health and epidemiology, I was just reflecting fairly recently how we talk so much in Western science and we applaud our father of epidemiology, quite rightly, John Snow, who as recently as 1857, he removed, famously removed the handle off the Broad Street pump, which is pictured here, to prevent more cholera deaths in London. And he did this in the face of ridicule from Cambridge University experts at the time who were still arguing that the cause of disease was in was miasma in the air. And this is 1857. That is recently, Aboriginal people have known about the safety of water, um, the importance of water safety and keeping it clean for so many thousands of years, we can't even date it. It's written into law that's been attributed to the creator ancestors. So in contamination of these precious water sources was one of the you know, a major source of conflict in the, with the, by the early settlers in, in the early days. And people's understanding of, of the importance of keeping our water clean was largely ignored and it continues to be ignored. And you know, we're really looking at what's happening around the world now with the environment and the path that we're heading on is we're all going to be extinct if we don't start to you know, wake up and listen to this. And it's not just the human species, but animals, plants and the rest of the planet as well. So, you know, it's really um, important that we start to recognise these important knowledge systems. And I really think that science done properly by Aboriginal people will reinforce a lot of the knowledge that Aboriginal people have been passing on for millennia. And finally, since arriving in this country, you know, there's been really poor research practice by Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people have been usually often used as experimental objects, barely human for scientific interest. My own Palawar ancestors in Tasmania have literally been dug out of their graves and body parts have been collected in jars and sent off in world and, and my own ancestor Dolly Dalrymple had to grow up in a house with an infamous surgeon who was responsible for a lot of that. So just a couple of, um, you know, and even recently we've, we've heard stories of this, these parts still being found in Tasmania within the last decade. Since then, we've had research conducted largely on Aboriginal people by people who have been given power and privilege with their superior knowledge. And there hasn't been any power for Aboriginal people at all. This has led to many distorted versions and understandings about Aboriginal people that reflect non-Indigenous values, beliefs and prejudices. And this is what's reflected in all of our 
guidelines, societal policies, our healthcare systems, because we don't control the education, we don't have the legitimacy of knowledge. And this is all comp compounded and reinforced. And we're seeing this in the continuous failure of the strategies and the programs to improve the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then the ironic end of it all is when these programs failed that have been designed by other people, we as Aboriginal people get blamed for it, which would be ironically funny if it wasn't so serious with people dying at a more than 10 years earlier than other Australians and having some of the highest teenage suicide rates in the world. So additionally, it's really important to understand the, in terms of health guidelines, which is what we're talking about today, that Aboriginal understandings of health are holistic, sophisticated and nuanced, and they're not often, this is not often reflected in existing research, which can be biomedical, restricted to narrow biomedical um, lens. It's centered around connectedness. And again, this is going back to the importance of the acknowledgement and acknowledging our country and our ancestors. And much of this has been disrupted by colonial violence and trauma. And we really need to rebuild this to be rebuilding health. So just to start with an overview of the guidance that's in the NHMRC guidelines, um, before engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities, really worthwhile for everybody to take time to reflect on your own values, principles and beliefs and understand the way our shared history impacts on relationships between um, yourself and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And the Lowitcher Institute have developed this beautiful video that talks about genuine two-way two -way knowledge sharing. And it's embodied in this Yongyu metaphor of Ganma. And Yongyu, is, this is people from Northern, uh, Northern Territory, right at the top of Northern Territory. And it's Ganma is a, a Yongyu word for where the lagoon meets the salt water and it meets fresh and the new, new knowledge that results from this blending without the loss of the historic history or integrity of both the sources. And it's a really important process to recognise and value the value this can add in bringing in the Aboriginal knowledge, knowledge systems into the Australian Health Guidelines. So I think we're going to go on now and Zachary's going to play the, the, um, the video. video. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Each person possesses knowledge. This is made up of facts, feelings, ideas, thoughts, experiences, interpretations, and stories. When people come together, they share their knowledge. Sometimes this is the same. Sometimes this is similar. Sometimes this is different. Sometimes no one knows. When it is not the same, or when no one knows, this is where research can help. The researcher is a facilitator and collector of information and synthesizer and translator of this information. The researcher is influenced by their own knowledge. The researcher utilizes three things, fellow researchers or experts, previous research and stakeholders. Stakeholders can include decision makers, the community of interest and the general public. The impact of research can be negatively influenced by bias, politics, power and fear. It can also be negatively impacted upon by poorly interpreted data and poorly constructed methodology. How do we exchange knowledge to find the truth and avoid the negative influences? Dr. Marika describes this formation of new knowledge as Ganma. Ganma is the name of a lagoon where salt water meets fresh water. Water is a symbol of knowledge in the Yolgmu philosophy and the metaphor for the meeting of two bodies of water is a way of talking about knowledge systems of two cultures working together. A river of water from the sea and a river of water from the land mutually engulf each other upon flowing into a common lagoon and becoming one. In coming together, the streams of water mix across the interface of the two currents and foam is created. This foam represents a new kind of knowledge. The 
forces of the stream combine and lead to deeper understanding and truth. Essentially, Ganma is a place where knowledge is recreated. Water, like knowledge, has memory. When two different waters meet to create Ganma, they diffuse into each other, but they do not forget who they are or where they come from. Using this metaphor, people from differing cultures and backgrounds can share deeply without losing their history or integrity. Right. Thanks, Zach. You able to change back to the other screen, Zach, or do I need to do that? Uh, if you just share your screen again, Kath. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Complete Luddite here. Yeah. <laughs> I love that video and thanks so much to, is that working now? Yes, it is. Right. Thank you. Really important video from um, Lowitcher. So I'll just go on to just the final slide, if I can just move on to the next one. Sorry about this slide, I'm just really having trouble moving on. There we go, great. So in the guidelines, we've got, I'll finish off this soon, so then we can go on to Jason giving a really good example. We've outlined key steps for engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in guideline development. And these include things like, first of all, considering the implications and the scope. So if guidelines have significant impact on Aboriginal people, it's really important to consider appointing Aboriginal person as the chair and in leadership positions. And in general, the general principle is the greater the implications, the greater the need for meaningful participation and greater power and leadership by Aboriginal people. It suggests as a minimum, if you're gonna be inviting people onto guidelines to have at least two people, because from personal experience, this is actually part of the Victorian guidelines um, with community engagement, but I'll you know, say so from personal experience, it can be, you, know, you feel like you're going a little bit crazy sometimes, sitting on those guideline committees and everybody's speaking a different language. So just to have somebody else there to, um, keep you sane and be really, really helpful. It's really important to be um, scoping the relevant issues, recognising that relevant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander information um, and, and perspectives and worldviews may not be included in the academic literature. So thinking about um, where you might be getting your information from. Starting a positive conversation. I mean, this is you know really fairly basic um, communication 101 stuff, but Cultural security, safety, awareness are all really essential for working effectively with the community in these relationships. They take time to develop. So it's important to start building them or working with people that already have established relationships, like the community controlled sector, and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives to be leading these conversations. And we have different, we have ways of communicating and, um, you know, Judy Atkinson talks about the importance of deep listening to Deary and really understanding, look, listening not just to what people are saying, but how people are saying it and thinking about that deeply. Seeking representation is really um, an important consideration. It's, we are a very diverse community, like I said, over 350 separate um, communities. And then within that, there's diversity layers upon. So it's important to recognize that and you know, differences between urban, urban, rural, remote areas, gender, language, sexuality, disability, and the like. Respect is really important part of Aboriginal culture. Um, we do have, you know, structured customs and courtesies that we, we follow. And so it's really important that, you know, we try to, to do this because you can really get off on the wrong foot if you're sort of barging in boots and all. Um, it's you know, seen as really rude and um, there's often local protocols to consider when engaging with communities that include kinship relationships and laws and things like that. So Aboriginal organisations can assist with this. It can take time, so it's important to factor that into guideline development. And there can also be a need to occasionally for translators and things like that, which can be particularly complicated because our you know, a lot of languages we don't have a lot of translators for, and um, you know, some of them are really at risk of losing them altogether. So that can be 
um, a complicated process, but you know, something that needs to be worked through. Communicating recommendations is, is effectively is really critical. And this is where you know, our Aboriginal community control sector really they excel in a lot of things, but communicating effectively with communities is an absolute strength. So it's not just about language, it's about talking in the right way, not using shaming or deficit focused languages, and also just you know, trying to make things a bit humorous and engaging as well. So I'll finish off now. So thank you all for just a bit of an introduction to these um, community engagement guidelines. I really hope when I emphasise the huge benefits of Aboriginal people getting more involved in um, health guidelines. And I think it's not only useful for Aboriginal people. I think, you know, if we can get things right for our mob, it's likely to be, it's more likely to be right for a lot of other people than um, you know, than the, the typical mainstream approach. I've been, I think we often estimate, underestimate the work that we're doing in the community sector. You know, I've been working in the mainstream um, services for quite a long time. And certainly my personal um, view is that there's some really incredibly high quality work going on in the community sector that's often not seen, um, not recognised for the high quality that it is. And we've certainly seen that Excel in COVID-19 with, um, and Jason will be talking more about that at a national level, but certainly where I've been working in the Department of Human Services in Victoria, the incredible Aboriginal leadership there in the response team has been, you know, really inspiring to see. So we can do this if we're allowed and um, I think we can get some really useful learnings that can be shared. So thank you everyone. I'm really happy to take questions at the end. I'll hand over to you, Jason. Cool. Thanks, mate. Um, so, oh, I need to stop you. stopping <laughs> sharing. Great. Um, so I want to start by acknowledging that I'm on Ngunnawal country and to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I also want to start by acknowledging CAF and, um, you know, as we'll say, this is a, this is a process that was developed on the run and uh, CAF brought a methodological rigour to what we were doing both through rapid evidence summaries, but also in interweaving cultural knowledge that was invaluable. And she was doing that all whilst working in Department of Human Services with Victoria and being within the Victorian um, outbreak. So um, she just gave so much to this and, I'm, and I've learned so much from her. Um, so these two photos up here, what on the right um, is uh, Mount Jinjera here in uh, Ngunnawal country. Uh, where I live and work at the ANU and for the National Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisation. And on the left is on Ganji country, uh, which is where the community of Yarrabar is, which is where I've been working as a clinician for the past 10 years. And today's really about bringing in those two pieces of um, my life to help create guidance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through COVID and, and also about the overall response to COVID amongst the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Um, I'm the face of a really big group. So um, behind me is the executive group that's been involved with this, which involves Nacho, the RACGB Faculty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health, and Mary and Kate are online today. ANU Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Unit, which sits within NSEF, and I, there's a few of the guys from there as well, the Lewitchie Institute and La Trobe with CATH. Um, we then also had this group of uh, clinical experts who are either Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clinicians or had extensive expertise in that. And that group was chaired by the current president of AIDA, the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, Dr. Tammy Schramm. And aside from the ANU and La Trobe, other universities were involved in developing guidance, including University of Queensland Post Centre, Deakins Nakiri Institute and Griffith University. So the, I don't know, the challenging, the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that it requires a complete rethink of our and complete whole of the health system, whole community um, response. Uh, so spanning in the health space from, from public health responses to, you know, acute care, like specifically intensive care um, responses. And within Australia, we've had a couple of shining uh, examples that are providing guidance for Australia. Uh, on the public health space, that has been through the CDNA's national guidance, which has been, uh, I know as the song, I don't know if anyone else knows it as the song, 
And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had input into this primarily through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 advisory group, uh, which is co-chaired by my boss, De the Deputy CEO of um, NACHA, Dr Dawn Casey, um, and reports to the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. And that group has developed uh, guidance specific for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, uh, and has been really um, central to the, the, the response. Um, on the other side, moving more towards the acute care is the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force. And I saw Britta was on the, um, the, the call and, you know, Britta has been part of my life for nine months now. Um, again, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had input into that and uh, Julian got in contact with us um, and I'm part of the guidelines leadership group. My boss, uh, Dawn, is uh, on the governance group. The primary care and chronic Disease, a chronic panel, disease panel is, um, has Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander GPs and actually the majority of people on that panel have vast experience in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. And we've tried to ensure that each panel has expertise in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. But even with that sort of, you know, good level of engagement within these two main guidelines, there were questions that were coming up that weren't being addressed um, or that were out of scope for both. And that's because uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have created these, you know, incredible health institutions that we call Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisations that, that are the only institutions in Australia that, that span public health and acute responses. So in my community where I work in Yarraba, you know, we, um, we employ a public health nurse. We have people focused on STI prevention and on smoking cessation and, and cultural determinants of health. And on the other side, they've got the doctors like me who are primarily looking at that acute care side of things. And so when you have a workspace that is sprawling, such a wide thing, and it's also got to deal with issues about supporting um, people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, you come with different sets of questions. So, um, we came up with a scope for these guidelines, which was about the practical application of the best evidence to guide prevention. I can't read the whole slide because it's blocked. Um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, it had to be a priority for clinicians that were providing services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and not addressed in other national guidelines because we wanted to avoid duplication. And it had to be actionable in primary healthcare services. And those are the those are things we use to help determine whether a question was in or out of scope. Our early questions related to how to protect communities but maintain a health staff workforce. So really questions about what we could do around isolation and quarantine, um, how to safely transport patients. Many of our patients don't have um, cars and so community members themselves at high risk of severe COVID-19 illness um, provide transports. We need to protect them and, and the patients. And, you know, within, um, uh, remote communities in particular, there's, there's a number of conditions that exist pretty much only within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. We wanted to understand what we might need to do differently to protect them. So I just wanted to give us a, a bit of a feel of how quickly everyone came together. Um, it's quite remarkable. Um, so 5th of March, and in the brackets we've got the number of cases uh, cumulative nationwide um, at each time point. So that's when the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, COVID-19 advisory group formed. And so that preceded the formation of National Cabinet by over a week. I came, I changed jobs on the 16th of March and, and stopped being an ANU academic for a while and, and dedicated myself to Nacho. Um, and one of the first things I was doing was trying to deal with all these uncertain certainties. And um, my colleagues at ANU committed to supporting Nacho through rapid reviews a couple of days later. Um, that weekend, uh, so we're now up to 13, we've gone from, you know, 198 to 1352 cases. Um, Julian, who heads the COVID-19 National Evidence, Clinical Evidence Task Force, gave me some calls and we started talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait engagement in the guidelines he was developing. And early the next week, the RACGP um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander faculty um, gave their support um, to what we were trying to achieve at Nacho and really provided the framework to do that, borrowing from what they'd done with the Nacho RACGP guidelines for preventative healthcare, which is they've done a couple of additions now. So there's an established structure and both the format and how these guidance are developed. Um, 
by the 5th of April, it became apparent to the ANU that what we were doing with this rapid guidance was unsustainable. I'd, I'd taken up everyone in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Unit's time. Um, and it was all completely unfunded at this stage. And they were just doing it because their commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health. Similarly, RSSGP was doing it with no funding commitment at this stage. We had our first ex committee start of April. By the by 23rd, two weeks later, Luitcha had got funding for um, research institutions to do evidence reviews. And within six weeks of um, having our first expert committee, we got our first three parts of guidance out there. Um, and that's felt too slow for us. But, you know, when you look at that and what's had to happen, and basically most of that had occurred on goodwill and commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, it's quite remarkable. Um, by the 1st of July, um, next financial year, the Department of Health had contributed some funds to sort of the coordination of the guidance. So it's just a really remarkable, both the timeliness and just how multiple organisations with the commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people came to do this. Don't want to dwell on this slide, just sort of those the complexity when working across multiple organisations. I guess the thing that links back to CAPS is that, you know, the chair of the expert committee is a Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander doctor and leader, Tanya Schramm. You know, within the group, we have Nacho, the which are community controlled organisations. Um, and we're using them to help in the governance, but also to help um, distribute the guidance to the appropriate channels. In terms of developing the recommendations, we had we had research teams that would be commissioned to, to do a rapid evidence summary. And the guidance for that was based on the NICE guidelines and the McMaster University approach. Um, and then Mary at the RACGP worked with the research teams to develop the recommendations and used at least two people from our expert committee help inform that process. But the whole guidance obviously had to go through the expert community before approval and also went through the RACGP's um, quality improvement, no, quality and safety committee um, and the RACGP board, as well as being approved by Nacho and it's sometimes being approved by the COVID-19 advisory group before, before being published. Uh, at the moment, we sit at seven different guidelines. They span from things around quarantine to how do we support the mental health of our um, healthcare workers um, to how do we safely transport people. And we have another three um, sets of guidance that are gonna be published soon. One is around managing mild COVID-19 in the home. And that came because we, we felt as an executive that the existing guidance um, that was out there wasn't fit for purpose. Um, there's another one around how you assess and manage the risk of serious illness, considering that a a huge proportion of our workforce are at high risk of um, severe COVID-19 illness. And then another set of guidance around moving in, in and out of the community. Um, at the moment, last count, uh, the webpage had had over 10,000 hits, which is a, I think, really good thing considering the size of the um, health workforce focused on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This is a screenshot of part of the guidance. Um, what it does is it follows RA, natural RACGPs and it has a section on the context um, and then the recommendations. Um, I really, if you're going to check out one of the recommendations to see what it's like, I would suggest you look at this one about the social and emotional wellbeing because it is a really good example about, okay, we need to do a rapid evidence summary and look at existing guidance, but we also need to bring in cultural knowledge and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of understanding and of approaching a problem. And, you know, this is one that Kath was quite involved with, with another Aboriginal academic who was doing the, um, the evidence summary. And, you know, I think it does really meld those two ideas really well together. And it thinks about organisational strategies as well as uh, individual strategies to help deal with the, you know, the increased um, prevalence of mental, well, stress really, um, for people working around COVID-19. So despite the successes, there's obviously challenges. First is really that, you know, the format, the rapid evidence summary isn't the appropriate method. In particular, we thought perhaps working groups of experts and community members might be more appropriate for some questions that we came to. 
And, you know, as amazing as it was that um, we put things together quickly, you know, more support for First Nations led involvement and capacity building. Um, we've got questions that remain unsolved, you know, people now asking what sort of screening procedures are relevant um, as COVID prevalence decreases. How do we support families and children with complex care needs in this environment? And we need to continue to work to disseminate and discuss the guidance. Um, we had applied for a, a, a grant to keep it going through a prize, but it was, it was unsuccessful. But you know, the things that we wanted to look at was to one, improve the timeliness, um, but probably most importantly is to build a community of practice to support First Nations capacity in responding to priority questions. And, you know, this is about supporting resilient communities, you know, being involved in the solutions and um, is an important part of building resilience within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, not just for COVID-19, but for future emergencies, which will undoubtedly come. And we wanted to learn from this process. We had no um, capacity to do some evaluation and to share these learnings so that we can um, respond effectively in the future. Now, we, I think we have, that's going to stop the guidance bit. And we just want to finish with talking about the COVID-19 response. I had another poll question, Zach, about, so do you want to pop that up now? Yeah, so, um, so this is just to just have a guess. How many COVID-19 cases have been confirmed amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples? And to help get you a ballpark, national cases are 27,865 as of yesterday. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 3.3% of, well, approximately 3.3% of the Australian population. Okay, it looks like everyone's in voting, Jason, and a couple more to go. Okay. All right, I'll share those results with everyone now. Cool. Cool, so majority got it right, okay? So, um, which is good. Uh, you know, if we were to look at just as a proportion of the population, it would be in that 800 to 1,000 um, group, but it's been an overwhelming success and, and uh, 147 people in the latest public report um, have had COVID-19. There's been no deaths amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and it's been more than 80 days since the last case. And, you know, the, the success of the response is starting to be recognised across Australia. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people have been talking about it since back in, um, well, actually that article from the NJ was first published in April. Um, but um, least recently, uh, Professor Fiona Stanley has been a really prominent non-Indigenous um, champion of, of the success of the response, the former Australian of the Year. Across, so this is looking at cases per 100,000 across each age group with Aboriginal and Torres Strait people in blue and in every age group it's um, significantly less and the age standardised rate is 0.2 of, compared to the non-Indigenous population. So, you know, markedly lower. The thing is, is that it, you know, it could have very much been the other way. And the fact is, is that at our last pandemic of H1N1 in 2009, it was, it was completely the other way. You know, so in that pandemic, Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, the notification rate was five times higher, the hospitalization and ICU deaths were eight times higher and the rates of deaths were, were five times higher. So just, it's been an absolute reversal of what happened with that pandemic. So thinking about what, is different. And so as a non-Indigenous person sitting within the response, for me, what is most obvious is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership across the board. Um, so, you know, there's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 advisory group um, that, you know, reports to the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. Um, but then Aboriginal community controlled organisations, including health organisations, but other community controlled organisations have been incredible in responding to the health and social needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And within each community, leaders have come up. And, you know, I think it's important to note that governments have listened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander more than, more than they have in the past. And that's been an important part of the success. There's been pandemic plans 
developed for and by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which didn't happen during H1N1. Um, in particular, the focus of our planning at the national level was to enhance access to testing. Uh, early in the pandemic, when testing was limited, uh, there was reports um, from AIDA around racism towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people trying to access testing. And there was a real concern that we wouldn't be testing and that we'd have undetected transmission going through the community. Uh, so the GP respiratory clinics are, you know, cornerstone of Australia's testing strategy and 23 of the 150 are within Aboriginal community controlled health organisations and predominantly within urban areas. And for our remote areas, they obviously had long delays in getting results at the start. And so, you know, world first, there's point of care testing machines within primary healthcare services across 87 um, remote and rural communities with large urban populations um, that have done over 16,000 uh, COVID-19 tests and really saved an incredible amount of time and money and, and really been you know, crucial to making sure that um, detecting things early if they were to come. Travel restrictions were a really prominent feature, but I think it's really important to remember that the majority of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people live in urban areas and COVID-19 has been predominantly in urban areas and it's really been the responses of those urban archos and urban community controlled organisations and people in those areas that have been central to the success. Communications has been excellent and as I said that's a function of the public health responsibilities that sit within archos so being able to tailor messages towards the community and often in language and while the pandemic was going on, um, Pat Turner, who's the CEO of Nacho and the head of the Coalition of Peaks, was negotiating a new national partnership agreement on Close the Gap. And while people focus on Close the Gap targets, what she's focused on and what we're focused on is the priority of reforms that the Prime Minister and each Premier um, has signed on to. And, and the success of the response for Aboriginal Torres Strait people has been in part because this has been an early example of what can happen when you try to implement these reforms. You know, we've seen formal partnership and shared decision making between governments and community controlled organisations. We've seen a focus of putting responses within the community controlled sector. Transforming organisational government organisations has happened with the relationships that have occurred during this. And for me as an epidemiologist, I've had an access to data that I haven't had in the past to help shape responses. But at the core, it is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and health workers in particular who, despite, you know, often having comorbid conditions that put them at high risk, living in crowded conditions that increase risk of spreading, have been there every day to, to support their communities. So I'm a bit over time, so I'll wrap it up. But really, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership has been the success of this response and has shown what, what can achieve as we work towards implementing the new national partnership agreement. And you know, the guidance that we developed was a real great example about um, multiple organisations with a strong commitment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health coming together and following those principles that um, Kath talked about at the start. So we'll leave it there for some questions. Um, Kath wanted to leave us with the um, Uluru Statement up while we answer the questions. Um, Kath, did you want to speak a little bit to the Uluru Statement? Yeah, thanks, Jason. That was fantastic to hear all that. Um, yeah, the Uluru Statement from the Heart is just a really important um, statement that's been agreed by all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. And we're really, you know, wanting to, yeah, it's an important part of our voice that we're wanting to have enshrined, enshrined in the Constitution. So just it's good to share that while we're having the yarn, I think. Thanks. Great. Right. Thanks, Kath, and thank you, Jason, for those fantastic presentations. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of questions come through, so we'll get into those now. We've got, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, but um, um, that's okay. And I see that no participants actually dropped off of the call today, so they must have been, um, everyone must have been enjoying those. Oh, that's good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, all right. So first question, I think it's for you, Kath. Um, do you have any specific strategies to facilitate the inclusion of Aboriginal people in guideline panels particularly regarding engaging respectfully? Um, well, I think Jason gave a fantastic example today um, about that being done. They, the review teams were, you know, had 
a lot of Aboriginal people involved in them. The, the fantastic example that he shared was led by James, Associate Professor James Charles, um, yeah, with some other support as well, which is great. So I think really recognising people's skills and expertise that they bring, also providing support. I think it's, it's not too much different than any other way that you would engage with people, but it's, it's really being supportive. I think one of the things that we really wanted to do more with this, that because of the rush with COVID, we didn't have as much time to do it all, like Jason said, is setting up the support um, with, with the webinars and the, you know, training and if that was needed and, and better, you know, more structured support systems. But I think, um, yeah, I think, does that answer the question around how to do it? I'm not. I think so. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Jason? Jason? Wait, I'm doing it. Now I can't find me. Or am I muted? No, I'm not no, muted. Okay, don't worry. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> No, I think, uh, I guess it's about, uh, you know, it's about in making sure that you're giving yourself the time as well to make sure someone's engaged meaningfully. You know what I mean? Like the worst thing in the world is when something is well down the process and then someone's like, oh, we should add an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, you know? Mm. It feels it's, really tokenistic, uh, not it's, respectful. It's yeah. a shocker, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I guess it's about having that at the forefront and, and doing that early and, and knowing that it might take time as well to, to build up relationships and find the right people. And, and thinking about power, I think, is important too, to be thinking about, you know, everybody's position in it and sharing that power and, um, you know, really fostering that leadership and sense of um, people's ownership and the value that their contribution is giving. Great. Thank you. Which is a lot. Uh, we've got another question that's come in um, and it says, when you consult and involve um, the first people, uh, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, how do you know when is enough? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, consultation is fairly low down the, the scale of participation. Um, that is a good question. I mean, it really is hard to know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'd be. Re, I don't know how I'd be interpreting that because I mean, people. If you have a good relationship, people will tell you. Yeah. And I think to be able to have the have the relationship is the central bit, and they should be able to tell you what you know, should be able to have that dialogue about what people's capacity is because we are all pretty stretched. Um, certainly, I feel you know. I'm, usually able to have those discussions but you know if, if people aren't feeling you know people people might just be walking away because they're feeling not in, not properly respected and valued and not wanting to engage as well so yeah I don't know without dialogue and actually understanding and having a proper discussion it'd be hard to interpret any sort of magical signs or anything like that yeah thanks Kat and I see we are we are running out of time. So I just wonder, one last question: Do you have any advice for people looking for more guidance um, on these topics and you know, in this area? Um, that's a good question. There is on the NHMRC engaging guidelines um, information. The Lowitcher Institute, then all they have got the so that the Lowitcher Institute's our first Aboriginal community controlled research institute. So they're a really important organisation and they've got a really strong knowledge translation um, segment. So there's certainly a lot of information there as well. Um, and I think that that's probably, that's probably the first point of call, I think. Okay, great. All right, well, I think we are um, coming out of time. So once again, thank you so much to Kath and Jason for taking your time. Uh, today to present to us. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And, and what a way to start the, um, this webinar series from ANZ Gin. So thank you so much for starting us off on a good night. Um, there, just, just quickly, uh, if you are looking for more guidance, you can always check out the guidelines for 
guidelines handbook, the NHMRC guidelines for guidelines. And once again, if you want to join our network, that's the website there. And just once again, a huge thank you both to Kath and Jason for taking the time out today to present um, to us all. And also a, a big thank you to Danielle Pollock, who, who, who really organised and, and drove a lot of this um, webinar, and also to Garant and Steph um, from NHMRC for all of their support as well. And if you have any feedback for us, considering this is, a, is our first webinar, please do send that on to us at that email address. But thank you all for coming. We're seeing some great comments coming through in the chat now. Um, thanks everyone once again, and we'll see you uh, next year sometime for our next webinar. So please stay in touch. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Zachary. Thank you. For organizing. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> Bye.